Welcome to the Investor Financing Podcast, where we interview real estate investors and lenders so you can learn all the secrets to getting your projects funded and scale your portfolio. Learn about fix and flip loans, Burr financing, rental, fix to rent, commercial, multifamily bridge loans, business loans, and so much more. And now, your host, Bo Eckstein. The weeks seem to go really fast fast ever since covid they go even faster you would think they would be slower but it seems that um as we're adapting to uh using zoom and uh we're actually almost uh learning a whole new world to be more productive and so i'm i feel like i'm connecting with people uh more often than i i would normally so it's each week is um learning something new and and figuring out i'm learning about all these tools that i didn't know about and softwares and things so i think you know, the, the way the future is here. And I was just reading about all these retail stores shutting down. Um, and that was going to happen, I think, anyways, right? It was it, the writings on the wall with with what's going on in the world. But what COVID did was it COVID just supercharged that in maybe five years, it would have taken place without COVID because of COVID. Now you're seeing, you know, Victoria's Secret uh, stores shutting down all these big retail co companies shutting down. So there's going to be a big movement, a big push to repurpose these properties. And, and so it'd be interesting to see what happens in the retail space. Um, but, you know, I, I'm excited. It seems that people are out buying and selling property right now like crazy. So it's busy. So true. So true, Bo. And again, you know, I mean, I definitely want to, you know, uh, say the same thing. I mean, last four months have been spectacular for Monil brand of companies that we have started building last six, seven years back, 14 years in the business in multifamily. It's been tremendous, tremendous. And I think that's what really is all about to take the lemon and make the lemonade out of it. You know, a lot of people have gone into a cocoon. They have gone into a, you know, depression and things like that. But a lot of people have really emerged as better uh, problem solver, I should say, you know, and expanding their horizons and businesses. And people are diversifying, like you said, into from stock market. Stock market is so high. Uh, I just don't know. I feel there is going to be a crash coming. I mean, you know, the, some of the things we are seeing, we're going to see their effect in third quarter and fourth quarter, right? The loss of productivity and everything. The jobless rate was great. This morning it's 10.41. All right, man. Here, everybody was predicting it's going to be totally gone to 20%, 25%. Look at YouTube. A lot of proponents of pessimism were talking about this whole USA is going to blow up. And, you know, we, we, you know, we were talking about the economic, uh, I know coronavirus is still affecting us and it will, you know, and look at the cases are kind of declining, but I think we are not really adhering to the standards. I really have a pet pee on that. I mean, people are dying because of some people not being as considerate as they should be you know, and so on. So I'm really excited to have a great guest with us today, right there. Uh, Alex, Alex, welcome, buddy. How are you? Thank you, Vinny and Bo, for having me on today. It's uh, it's great to uh, expand into new platforms. We, uh, we, uh, we're, we're big proponents of investing in real estate here in Advanta. Uh, you know, that's the, the primary focus of the majority of what our clients do. Um, throughout about, uh, I think last count, about 1.5 billion of assets, about 60% of that uh, is invested in real estate with our clients. So oh, wow. it's, um, it's, it's cool to see. And it's and it's really interesting to see the trends that have that have popped up throughout this uh, you know, since March with coronavirus. It's really been kind of interesting to see <clears throat> the, wide, uh, the wide snapshot that we get here of everything from large multifamily to single family to lending, uh, just, just to everything to see where trends are going. So thanks for having me on today. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. I want to formally introduce you. Thank you so much. We have known Adventa for some time now, about maybe a year, year and a half. And my a lot of my investors have worked with you guys. And I'm so happy. Uh, that's Alex Perney. I would like to introduce Alex, actually, having worked with Adventa since 2012, eight years. Alex Perney is a eight-year veteran, of course, of self-directed IRAs. So we're going to be talking about self-directed 
IRAs, retirement plans today, guys. Again, everybody joining us, please let us know where you are from, your name, and please ask us questions in the chat room. We would love to answer them. Uh, IRAs and alternative assets throughout his career, his adventure, he has worked with clients on over 1,200 different deals, 1,200, that's a lot, ranging from single family homes, multifamily partnerships, private securities, and mortgage lending. His specialty, specialty knowledge and industry experiences enable him to educate clients and investors on self-directed IRAs. So that's going to be our main topic today and we're going to ask some very very good questions and expand the knowledge because lots of hundreds of people watch us after the broadcast and you know it's always li you know recorded live as you all know you can ask us any kind of questions and just how powerful these tax advantage accounts can be no welcome alex and kind of tell us a little bit depth of you're in florida but your company is able to help clients all over USA. Is that right? Correct. And we work, uh, you know, throughout the, the, the US, you know, all 50 states, we have clients that invest internationally as well. Um, you know, if you have an IRA, um, you can you can really deploy it wherever you'd like. Uh, just this past week, I'm working with a client on acquiring some property in Belize. So I've done uh, I've done property purchases, um, you know, throughout Central and South America from Colombia, Panama, mm -hmm. uh, Nicaragua, Belize, United States, Canada. So um, it's really wherever you find the deal. If you have an IRA, we can we can get um, you know get some something, something structured where you can pursue those deals. Excellent, excellent. Can I kind of I I read some statistic very lately that twenty eight point four trillion dollars is in retirement funds. Could you give us some idea, like you know what that big number is? Majority of that is in the Wall Street, right? What I hear, right? Sure. Yeah. When when you start throwing out numbers that have four commas in them, it's always uh, a little bit tantalizing to figure out where exactly that is. Now that number is is representative of a few different things. It's representative of IRAs, so the individual accounts people hold, 401ks. It's uh, large pensions, like you'd see with United Auto Workers and large unionized labor forces. Uh, so it's although it is a very large number, it does give a good idea of just the fact that there's a lot of money in these types of plans. And it's ultimately up to the individual as to what happens with those. And what we try to promote is the fact that you have more options than just like you said, Vinny, of just sticking at the stock market. You know, a lot of that, I would say we don't have exact figures, but our best guess would be probably about five to seven percent of the whole market is truly self-directed so people are doing alternative investments the other big chunk of that money is it's just stocks bonds mutual funds so true so true and again you know a lot of our audience is very very educated you know alex but definitely what happens is the big boys i said big boys you know like the vanguards the schwabs you know the uh, tito price i'm just thinking about mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, other people, oh, my gosh, I have accounts with all of them. <laughs> they don't let you invest into syndications, you know, right. like in real estate, for example, right? Or alternative, uh, as, you know, investments. And Yeah, ab absolutely, Vinny. So when you're when you're looking at that from the perspective of especially multifamily, I know that's what you focus on. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to syndicated deals, when it comes to joint, uh, joint ventures, limited partnerships those investments are allowable in an IRA. So when you go to someone like a T. Rowe Price or a TD Ameritrade, you know, although they are allowable, it's not what that company specializes in doing. You know, they, you know, the person you may talk to may say, oh, you can't do that or you have to take the money out. That's yeah. part of a lack of education just on and no fault of that person that told you that. They just don't understand it's like a we offer. So we, off we operate in that niche of allowing for those types of investments, um, you know, those limited partnerships, those uh, syndications and things to occur within that tax advantage umbrella of an IRA or 401k. Totally, totally. And I do want to let the audience know that, of course, they could invest in REITs, right? That's real estate investment trusts. Of course, they have very big, you know, bears out there. They are on the stock market and all, and they could invest in that, right? But those returns you cannot control. But in the self-directed arena, you can control where you put your money, your retirement. Is that right? 
Correct. That's that's exactly that's exactly correct. And and to the point of REITs, you know, those are publicly traded. Um, you know, they're they're highly illiquid. You know, you get into them, you can't really get out of them. We do see some clients doing private REITs that aren't traded on a public market. Uh, pre-capitalized REITs we do see occasionally, not not a whole lot. Um, but if that is something, you know, that I would say more people that are interested in syndications are probably the ones looking at private uh, non-capitalized REITs. Those are also something that you can do in a self-directed. Sure, sure. Bo, buddy, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I've been um, an advocate of self-directed vehicles for a long time. I mean, I, you, you can see the benefit of being able to do transactions tax tax deferred, right, uh, or tax-free if it's a Roth, right? So um, the advantages are great. I mean, I think more and more people are catching on to this. And there's a lot of people out there right now that have worked at a company as an employee and have a this, like, hanging 401k that they're not doing anything with right that they could potentially self-direct maybe they're getting terrible returns but they just don't know yet that they're able to take that 50 100 200 thousand dollars and self-direct it right now it's just sitting out there doing nothing for them right so we got to educate people and then, then then they can learn that they can actually invest in syndications or like Vinny, remember you, you did a deal with mario and i and, and he was our gap lender on a fix and flip deal, right? He lent the down payment and the rehab funds and we had a hard money loan first and he, he went into second position and then he got an equity share in that property. So there's so many ways to, to utilize these funds. And I think that it just, it's just a matter of people, you know, b building a network where they can, you know, feel comfortable investing in, in these types of transactions. And so I think there's also, now your company, Alex, um, some companies allow for like if Vinny were to invest in, say, I had a startup company um, and we did, you know, something in fintech for real estate, he could actually invest in the LLC with his uh, self-directed or are you guys only asset based, like real estate based? No. Yeah, we, we see a lot of that. So, um, you know, to, to both of your points that you, you indicated, the uh, the gap funding and uh, uh, equity participation uh, type deals are ones that I find really cool. We have a lot of clients that do that. But to the point of the uh, investment uh, into an LLC, let's say it's just a, a small multi-member LLC, three or four members, you can absolutely bring an IRA into that. And we do allow for our clients to do that. So if you wanted to have a more pointed like investment vehicle that you're going to use to invest into something like uh, real estate fintech, like you mentioned, we will allow for our clients to uh, uh, hold those types of private memberships within their IRA for, for those types of returns. That's really good. That's really good. And it, it, I'm curious, Vinny, like in your real estate syndications, what are you seeing as far as how many of your investors are using IRA funds right now? You know, that's a good point, Bo. Actually, you know, I have uh, very limited, almost, let's say, 200 investors who have millions of dollars invested in our syndications, but they came out with cash, they tested and proven record, then they opened up their retirement funds and everything. So majority of them have both now, you know, cash, which they had, savings, and then a lot of 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, self-directed checkbook IRAs. That's mm -hmm. another thing I think I heard a lot, you know, about EQRP and all that. So you're right. I would say, Bo, maybe in the last 12 years that I've been raising money and uh, buying uh, deals, uh, I don't know, maybe 34% is the number comes to my mind that's one third money is through retirement plans wow you know and i remember some other syndicator was talking about 43 percent of the money is coming through retirement self-directed you know into and making great returns because you know when you do reads right uh alex how much are they giving like six percent eight percent what do you what do yeah you think? it's uh if you're lucky if you're getting one that's paying out like that uh, certainly and the uh, the big thing I always like to, to bring to people is is the huge amount of tax savings. You know, it's easy enough to say that, you know, okay, well, I have this money coming in, I'm not paying taxes on it. But there's a bigger picture to that. Uh, when you can have money coming back in, uh, if you're doing it personally, you have to, you know, uh, carve out a certain section for, for what you're owed in taxes. A lot of these times for syndications and, and partnerships, you know, they're not withholding taxes out of anything they're paying out. If it's on a K-1 or a 1099 to their investors, mm -hmm. you're just getting a lump sum of cash and it's up to you to, you know, make sure that you have enough to pay your taxes at the end of the year or plan accordingly for that. 
cool thing about the IRA is that, you know, all of those funds coming in are non-taxable, you know, at that point, whether it's a Roth or traditional makes no difference. Mm -hmm. You can get those funds, 100% of them redeployed into another deal that comes along immediately and not have to worry about holding back, you know, 20, 15, you know, whatever your tax liability might be. So that's one really cool point that I like to bring up is it doesn't matter if it's a Roth, it doesn't matter if it's a traditional, SAP, simple, 401k, you get that same tax exempt at the time, tax exempt at the time of investment, return that's really important for reinvesting the returns i appreciate that no that's so true alex what you're saying because many times when you're putting cash outside the retirement plan of course you get the cash flows right you know we pay quarterly but then you get the k1 k1 will give you negative uh, whatever because of accelerated depreciation which we do mm -hmm. on the real estate deals so that way it's a passive loss and a lot of our investors, doctors, attorneys, CPAs, entrepreneurs, they cannot write it off, right? They have to keep on accumulating or bat it against the passive income. Mm -hmm. But the active income and passive income cannot be combined. But in the Roth and in the self-directed route, what you are just saying, it's deferred, right? So they never have to pay taxes, but the money comes in all these dividends or cash flows keep on coming. And when we sell the property and make 40% gain or 50% gain, that gain goes back into IRA too. So no capital gain tax. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, more, more to the point to drill down on that a little bit is that, um, you know, when you have accelerated depreciation, when you're looking at, um, you know, when you send out your K-1 and you're informing your, your clients and the investors as to, you know what exactly you are uh, doing with that yeah. uh, as far as what what they can take as a, a loss or a carry forward you don't have to worry about that with an ira um you don't have to worry about the capital gains it's just it, it's even though it's a new way of investing for a lot of people it simplifies your tax life immensely you don't have to look at you know if you're trading stocks you don't have to look at tax lots you don't have to look at uh, your underlying basis or depreciation it's just a cash on cash return and then you can reinvest it and then you only worry about taxes uh, if it's a deferred account in, in retirement. Totally, totally, totally. Please share with us, like, you know, and so we have, uh, as a syndicator, I very much know about the arm's length, right? Mm -hmm. They cannot invest into their own deals. So it's better for many, many of my clients and investors that they could invest into somebody else's deal. Can you kind of expand on that? Absolutely. So with regard to IRAs, there, there are some rules. You can't uh, buy or sell anything to yourself personally or what's called a disqualified individual. A disqualified individual is look at your family tree. You go up and down and directly to your left, uh, which would be your spouse. So spouses, you can't buy or sell anything to. You can't buy or sell anything to your children mm -hmm. or your parents. Now, that's all well and good. But in the, in the sense of syndications, um, if you set up a syndication, um, more often than not, you cannot use your own IRA funds to invest in it. Right. Or right. if your um, spouse did or if your child did, mm -hmm. uh, you can't directly invest in those syndications. There are instances, though, depending on how you syndicate, whether it's under a uh, Reg D or Reg A under the Jobs Act, where if it is a open solicitation and you're not getting any type of um, uh like additional benefit from your IRA, you can mm. potentially invest in that. Um, I always refer people to check with a uh, an ERISA attorney or some type of syndication attorney on that point um, because the answer is not always no. Um, I've seen it happen um, in some different instances where they they kind of blessed it and there was no issues with it. But um, you know, those are more often than not those are the rules that kind of govern uh, the generalities of IRA. Thank you, thank you, uh, Alex. Um, so like, let's just take one of Vinny's syndications and some of his limited partners, let's say they want to invest um, both from their cash in hand and also their IRA, you know, two different entities. It's them personally investing as a limited partner. Can they, can their, uh, potentially can their IRA also invest in that same LP or same par limited partnership as an LP? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I see that framed in a few different ways. Typically, either some, either the the, sh the either it's um, the price per share. If it's if it's broken out like that, might be um, you know too big for the IRA to take down uh, by itself. If the syndication will allow for joint ownership, you can do it like that. Or if they just have like um, a dollar for dollar investment structure with it, you can come in together. You can bring personal cash and IRA cash directly into the same deal. 
the only thing you have to be careful with is that you have to make sure that, you know, you are not selling something that you personally own to your IRA. So if you're coming in new and your IRA is coming in new, that's fine. But if you already, let's say, had 30 shares and you wanted to bring your IRA in, you couldn't split out or bifurcate your own portion to your IRA. But if everything's coming in new into the syndication, it's not a problem. Beautiful, beautiful. I know we have done that, Bo. Like I talked to my SEC attorneys. I know seven of the top SEC attorneys in USA. I'm so glad. And they have also become on my show and we have had contacts and all. So we do let, you know, our investors bring in cash and the IRA. We set up two accounts, separate accounts within the LP structure. And then the cash, cash flows go back into their accounts. But for the IRA, we deposit money into the IRA account. So that's separate. It's not combined. But for the qualification of their tier level of investment, we combine those two together to give them high returns because that's on our side, right? So our their IRA also gets a high return and there because we do tier investing. Alex, that's how we do it. We do it yeah. 100,000 investor. 200,000 investor and 500,000 investor. Mm -hmm. So that way, you know, they can get higher. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, so Alex, so, so guys out there, guys and girls out there that are at more active people like Vinny, people that are flipping houses that are always looking for investors or would like investors to participate in the, in the projects. What, it, what have you seen that others are doing successfully to kind of harness all these people and educate them? You know, because a lot of people don't know about self-directed IRAs. I mean, it's starting to become more mainstream, but still, it's still maybe, I don't know, 20 or 25 percent of the, uh, you know, people with retirement accounts seem to know about self-directed. The rest, you know, 70 percent of people don't know what's good, anything about what are you seeing investors out there or, or active deal makers like Vinny and, and, and people like that doing to, to, you know, educate people on this and, and actually build a list of potential uh investors yeah that's that's really the the question that is the the main focus of our business at advanta uh you know education is the really the big part of what we do you know it's not uh, so much of like the the advertising so much as as is getting on things like this or hosting our own uh webinars and podcasts and things like that to educate people because it's not something easy to explain it's not terribly complicated but you need to have someone initially initially explain to that knows what they're talking about and then that person can go educate others. It's not hard, you know, once you have the basic understanding. But, you know, if you tell someone that's 55, that's changed jobs, like Benny said, that had an old 401k, that, you know, someone passing says, hey, you can invest in real estate. Well, I can mean 90 different things. So the education is the big part. Um, most of the time, what I see is that it's it's a very organic thing. Um, but but to, to the most uh, uh, specific point to your question, it's stuff like this. It's, it's Zoom calls, it's networking. It's going to events like Vinny hosts. It's going to uh, things where you can actually get in front of people and, and let them know about it. Um, but it, it's a tough one. I mean, that's that's what we spend the majority of our marketing dollars on and, and a lot of our focus and time and advantage is figuring out how to educate people um, because it's the people that do it once, they get it. They know it. They, yeah. they see that they see the advantage of it. They can go tell other people. Let me ask. Uh, oh, let me, go ahead. Go. Go. Let me ask you another question, and I was just wondering. So let's just say, hypothetically, um, my father had a five million dollars in in his IRA, and he was getting to the point where you know he was, um, you know, he he was on his deathbed, hypothetically, and I was named as a beneficiary. I've heard something in the past about like, and let's just say I'm I'm forty years old, and 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 so I'm named as the beneficiary of this, of this, um, SEPA Roth IRA. Um, is there a way I, I've heard before, like they called it like a legacy IRA when it was inherited that I could actually use those funds before I was of retirement age. Is that true? Or do you know anything about that? I'm just curious. Oh, ab absolutely. Um, there's been a lot of changes actually with that, um, in this tax year. So, um, to scale, let's go back to 2019 for a second. Um, what you were saying, absolutely, what people like to call them is a stretch IRA. Um, it's an inherited IRA, and people like to call it the stretch IRA, where you used to be able, if, if you received a IRA from your non-spouse, so in this case, your father, you could take the 
um, payments out of you had to take payments out of that IRA every year uh, between your joint life expectancy. So you calculate, run it through a calculator, you figure out what your life expectancy is, factor it in with theirs, and you had to take a certain amount out. You had to, you didn't pay any penalties on that. You just got money that was potentially taxable every uh, every year. Now the big change that just happened, and there, again, so that did get to your point of you know you didn't have to pay that penalty. What just changed, there was a piece of legislation called the SECURE Act. It changed a bunch of stuff with regard to taxes uh, for and tax filers. But what it did is to say, if you inherited that same IRA from your father. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Are you looking for funding? Are you getting frustrated trying to find a lender? Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and click the Get Funding button. Complete the simple form and schedule a free phone consultation with one of our placement specialists. We have a proprietary directory of funding partners that can help you get the funding you need. It's fast and easy to explore the options available for your specific needs. Don't wait. Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and get connected. You have 10 years from the date that you inherited from the year in which they died to fully deplete that account. So over the next 10 years, you can either do small chunks every year or on that 10th year, you have to distribute all of the funds from that account. Now, if it's a Roth IRA, it's all non-taxable, but you, you remove it from that awesome tax shelter. If it's a traditional IRA, you're going to have one heck of a tax bill. Um, so it's uh, it's something that, you know, I, I understand why the IRS did it. You know, they got to get more money from these things. There's so much money in these tax deferred accounts they haven't touched. They, they have to get revenues. But uh, it's not something that I think benefits really any of our clients or, or any retirement uh, planners out there is to, to say that you have to deplete these accounts in 10 years. So there were, were some changes, um, but you do get rid of the penalty in a, in a beneficiary IRA for distribution. Wow. wow. Very good question, Bo. Thank you. No, I was going to ask you, Alex, can I take, take me through? Like, you know, I know a lot of my investors are reaching your company and I'm so proud, Scott and you and, uh, and your whole company, how big it is and what is, uh, and what entails. If somebody wants to work with you guys, how does it work? Oh, it's, it's a really easy process. And that's, that's part of back to Bo's question of, um, you know, um, you know, how, how it works with people, educating people, uh, we try to make it a very hands-on process. So that way people that do come in can be those people that can go out and, and educate people. But essentially you open the account, it's just a little bit of paperwork. Uh, and then we assign you to a dedicated representative that goes through and, and goes, you know, from, from moving the funds over to actually getting the deal funded, um, is your s single point of contact. That's what I actually started doing back in 2012 was, was working with clients on a one-on-one -on -one basis to actually do deals, structure them correctly, fund them. Um, but it's, it's just that price, it's about three steps, you know, open the account, identify the deal, and then we fund it. Um, and then from there, we take care of the bookkeeping and record keeping. You do, you do take care of that. I see, I see. Now you are custodian. Are you like Pensco and Entrust and uh, Equity Trust or IRA Trust? Are you similar kind of company or are you different? I mean, the, the product that you're going to get from any of those um, of our competitors is relatively the same. You know, you can self-direct your IRA, you can invest into a syndication. None of that uh, functionally changes. Really, what you see the difference in between companies is customer service. That's really the only thing that can change. They can let you invest in real estate just like we can. Um, but it boils down to the customer experience of having that direct line of contact, um, being able to get someone on the phone. A lot of those places use phone banks. Um, and not to disparage them, they've done phenomenally well. I would... I, I hope that one day we can get to the size and scale our product to the size of a Pinsco or, a, or an equity trust. That would be amazing for, for all of our employees involved. But that's that's kind of it. It's, it's just, um, you know, we focus on the customer. We're a very customer centric company. So we want to make sure that um, instead of just kind of turning through their investments, we, we educate them. We, we try to continually make the process easier for them and give them good lines of communication. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I don't know if you are able to speak of fees or anything like that. It's up to you. But, yeah. uh, you know, if you want to share something to our well, audiences, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's, you know, we try to be very upfront um, with, with our fees. It's very, very simple. Um, if you want to do uh, an investment through, our, through your IRA, you have one of two choices. We can either bill you for the number of assets, which is just about $300 per year per asset. So if you do one syndication, 
at 100,000 or 300,000 or a million. It's just a flat 295 per year for that investment. Now, if you're someone that likes to do a lot of smaller investments, um, instead of paying 295 for each one of those, uh, we have a value, uh, like a, a scaling value chart that'll just give you a flat fee for the amount of uh, value you have in the account. And so we try to make it work um, as best as possible with clients. And then depending on what you're doing, again, to uh, Bo's question with LLCs, some clients will structure stuff under LLCs or trust to help, um, you know, shield from a little bit of our fees. And, and we're happy to help with that as well. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, what's amazing, too, is that, you know, for those of you that are listening or will be listening in the future that, you know, I, as I've gone to all these real estate events and even the people that are just starting out, you know, just set up their IRA, let's say, and maybe that's only got two or $3,000, you know, they're just starting there. I've seen people um, where they've, 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 uh, their, their IRA was in contract to purchase, you know, a multifamily property, Vinny, or, you know, maybe it was a 14 unit property. Mm -hmm. and, and then what they've done is they've just assigned the contract. The IRA assigned the contract, oh. and they, and then their two thousand dollars that they started with became a fifty or a hundred thousand dollar assignment fee. Went back in tax free or tax deferred into their. So right. so you know the idea is get started even if you only have a thousand bucks to open your account, right? Like that's the that's the whole thing. And then you can do selectively you can do these big deals, right? Like what if you were able to take a thousand bucks and make it into 50 or 25,000, right? And then you, then eventually you can then, you know, have some working capital to, to put into some, you know, yeah. your deals are a hundred thousand plus. I mean, not everybody's got a hundred grand to start with, but yeah, sure. that's some encouragement for people that, you know, are just getting started. Yeah. So to, to speak to that, I, I've seen a couple of things and I can, you know, obviously kind of round numbers and, and protect identities, but some of the cooler things that I've seen, uh, with regard to large growth on a lot of deals with small amounts of money initially were, were things like options and wholesaling. Uh, you know, people will get something under contract. Um, the one particular individual that, that I'm thinking of was doing uh, single family homes. It wasn't uh, larger apartment buildings, but the, the, the idea can, can certainly translate to that. But uh, he was actually doing it through um, an education savings account, an ESA, which is another kind of account we offer for his children to help pay for for uh, expenses and throughout, I want to say the process of about it's about four years. I worked with him, and then at the culmination of it, um, he had enough to pay for all of their college, well over several times. I think I, when I stopped managing the account, he had gone from somewhere like fifteen grand to two and a quarter, three hundred grand in like five years of just and. And even though he had plenty of money to even do like equity participation notes or syndications, he just kept hammering on those thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollar deals of, of turning and flipping contracts and, and made a killing. Obviously, he you know educated himself and he knew what he was doing, um, and that's not for everyone per se. But he 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 hit it. He had it out of the park with that one. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent, Alex. I'm so glad. Look at that. Somebody is saying <laughs> muscles there. I love that. You know, thank yeah. you so much. I know that's my little thing. I uh, just before the show got into the studio. Well, my home is my studio, my office, everything. And uh, really excited. I hope uh, I know at the peak we had about 20, 21 people, I think, uh, watching us. Please go ahead and ask us any questions. I know we are asking fabulous questions of Alex, and he's giving us wonderful, wonderful, you know, ideas and so forth. So I would like to say, Alex, in the COVID, how that has helped or hurt your business, and what are some new laws that have come about in the you know, retirement uh, side of the business. Yeah, yeah. Gr great question, Vinny. And, and there certainly have been. Most people are familiar um, with the uh, the enhanced $600 unemployment benefits that have come out. Um, that was all under the umbrella. And, and the $1,200 direct payments to individuals were all under a piece of legislation called the CARES Act. Yeah. Now, that does have specific uh, ramifications for your IRAs and 401ks. Uh, if you were deemed, if, if you self-certify that you had any type of uh, hardship from COVID. And they le intentionally leave that very ambiguous uh, for the purpose of making sure that they don't exclude anyone that had something they didn't think of. But you can uh, take up, up to $100,000 out of a 401k penalty free mm -hmm. as a hardship distribution. 
Um, and they also have allowed for you to take a three-year rollover period for any funds taken out of an IRA without a penalty. So you can take unlimited funds out of the IRA and you have three years to roll that back in. You have a hundred grand you can take out of an, a 401k. Uh, the only thing is, is that I would, if, if you are doing that, um, my, my, I can't, I can't stress this enough is that the guidance from the IRS right now is, is very uh, lacking. Uh, I'll say, because what they're saying right now is that you can roll those funds back in, not pay any taxes. But what they're telling you is that you either claim a third of that money every year as taxable income and pay the taxes, um, or you pay it all in one year. So if you took a hundred thousand dollars out, they're saying that, you know, let's call it a 20% tax bracket. You kick out 20, you kick out 20 grand to the IRS in taxes. And then if you roll it back into an account after three years, you'd have to amend three years of tax returns to claw that money back. Wow. I would highly anticipate they're going to update this. That seems like a huge burden to people. Mm -hmm. um, so just for the listeners out there, whether it's now or in the future, if you are planning on utilizing that, check with a CPA first. It is not um, as straightforward as the government would like, like you to think. So, so really do look at that. And as far as business goes, it's it took some getting used to it in the beginning. Um, right around the March, April, it was – you know, everyone was trying to figure out what was going on, how to operate our business. Uh, but we really settled into it. Um, we have rotating teams in our office. Uh, we've moved some people to work from home, uh, you know, more, more on a permanent basis. And um, it's it's really, it's going great right now. We've, uh, we've really kind of turned the corner with our business uh, back to kind of, you know, what we were used to. Um, you know, we're still reaching people, getting out there and doing it. And um, yeah, it's, it was it was weird to say the least to, to transition a very tight, uh, knit office, you know, that we're all used to seeing each other every day and going to uh, whatever this is. Um, but it brings up a question that I've had that I, I like to ask a lot of people in the multifamily space, and I'll put this to Bo and you, sure. uh, is that one thing that I, I imagine will happen, and, and at least in the near future, is that we've seen such a adoption of work from home for people. Um, you know, really the, the benefits of the uh, decreased overhead for employers uh, and a lot of other things. Um, but one thing I see a big issue in in the commercial uh, real estate space is that you're going to see a lot of companies that are going to need to or, or just want to downsize their office overhead. You know, yeah. They don't need to have these people in there. You know, what's going to happen to some of these places that are just, um, you know, cubicle farms? Uh, you know, have you seen any issues uh, with with people that are invested in stuff like that or, or larger commercial buildings? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Where, where might that go? You know, I would love to kind of tackle it. Let's go to 2007 and eight. Actually, that's when I got started. I mean, you know, I was having single family homes all over USA and things like that. I was a motivational speaker and we said, you know what? We want to go into multifamily when I became broker. And I came to know Bo about three years back, but Bo also has been in that industry, in the real estate industry. But what happened at that time, Alex, was shopping centers, I mean, drop like crazy, you know, there was foreclosures all around, right? I mean, uh, industrial hospitality got hurt very badly. I'm just taking us back there, right? With all the derivatives and I mean, of course, a big fall of single family homes, as you all know, a lot of communities totally got wiped out because of the submerged, you know, mortgages and all, but multifamily, again, you know, that's the field I chose back then multifamily because I just felt like people will need, you know, shelter over their head. <laughs> that is in every economic situation. And that's what I find right now. Maybe Bo can also expand on it. Right now we are seeing probably housing is not going to go down that much, but the retail space and the office space, they'll be glut big glut coming up uh shopping centers oh my gosh with so many businesses closing and restaurants not opening and a lot of other businesses that's going to be again downward trend in the pricing the nois are going to decrease a lot of delinquencies are happening right now a uh, lot of toxic i say toxic on the rent rolls of every commercial building right now where people are not able to make ends meet and everything so there is a big wave coming, so as to speak, you know, where all these commercial uh, space will be up for, I don't know, I, I should say up for grabs, but there'll be other ways to convert them 
maybe Bo can expand on it into more residential, or I'm even thinking that apartments that I am, I'm, I don't build them, you know, right from scratch. I've been buying them already built, but I think the new way for the next 10, 20, 30 years is going to be two bedroom and an office, one bedroom and an office, because working from home, not getting on the freeway for two hours to get to the space and then be really, you know, very, very stressed out and then give your productivity and then get in the car and come back home again. Those days will be lesser and lesser and lesser, you know, and what we have found also with the jobs, which don't need too much contact, I think they can be done much better, <laughs> you know, from the home office, uh, along with the kids at home productivity is still there in the engineering sector and other and even the medical profession as you know they're able to do they're able to do actually uh, online visits i mean it's amazing how doctors can visit almost 70 people sitting in their office and they're able to do all that and uh, again you know online uh, you know uh, degrees you can get now right online from Harvard and online from Stanford and everything, that's going to really make a big, big difference in people's thinking, hey, why do I need to spend $70,000? I know there is interaction and everything with the students, but I think all those things are coming. To say the summary, you know, how I feel, it's going to change the way we live, the, the way we interact and how we work. And I think our lives will have more time more time if you are not having downtime and uh, travel time and stress time the roads will be much you know cleaner and you know ammunition i mean emission of the smoke will be less consumption of the oil and i mean a lot of repercussions are coming but would there be a glut bo i'll i'll drop you there what do you think bud over there. I, I tend to agree. People need a, a, a place to live. So I think housing, you know, as far as single family and, and multifamily will stay, you know, there might be, you're seeing signs of some of stress, obviously, in more of the lower end markets, um, lower economic areas, because obviously um, they're going to be hit first. Whereas most of the A and B properties, they're, uh, they're high paying jobs where most of them are using technology. So they're working from home successfully. Mm -hmm. um, my brother, for example, is a financial service guy and he works for a large mutual fund company and they're having their best. People are parking billions and billions of dollars with this company, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, people don't know what to do with their money. So, you know, he's, he's on cloud nine because he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm staying at home. I'm, and he's, he was get he was getting chubby. <laughs> now he now, he, has to, now he, he was stressed out and my point was he was stressed out now he's got one of those those bikes the pedal pedal alone bikes yeah yeah pedal. yeah and then and he's like working out every day i've never seen him more happy and i think for guys like him you know this is just this is perfect for him so you know there's gonna be a lot of pain there has to be with so much in the retail world and so much shift going on but i agree with Vinny. you're gonna see emerging markets such as these ghost kitchens right people are going to like you know there's going to be instead of a million restaurants there's going to be a ghost kitchen commercial kitchen with 12 or 13 restaurants and they you could probably eat inside but there's also going to have you know grub hubs and things you're already seeing them invest and then a lot of these you know what look at like 24-hour fitness which is a, a huge gym franchise on the west coast they're, they're, they i think they're found bk and they're shut down a bunch of bunch of um, places, right? So you're seeing shifts like that happen. You're seeing the retails going under, you get seeing small businesses get hit. So it's gonna be definitely pain, um, but out of pain always comes some kind of a emergence of new opportunities. And mm -hmm. so I think like, you know, we have to think positive and we, we, we know the population is growing. People are gonna need places to live. You know, people are gonna need assisted living facilities. People are gonna be relocating from Inner, uh, the cities to going and say, hey, I want to go live in Florida where I can live by the beach and I'm not on top of everybody, right? So if you're building and developing the right products, I think it's a, it's a booming market like, and people need that. So um, I think in the, in the interim time though, there's going to be pain. I'm just not sure as how much pain, um, but I do think that, you know, some of the reports I've seen that there's a devastation of small business and restaurants and 
even big franchises that are happening. So it's, I don't know what, what it's going to look like in a year from now. I'm, you know, maybe a year from now we're going to go, Oh, it wasn't as bad as we thought, but, or maybe it, it just, you know, I guess living through 2007 and eight where I got devastated, but you know, at the same time, I didn't have the same uh, education I have now. I was in my twenties. I didn't understand, you know, market cycles. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, because I lived through that, it's, it's made me a little bit more nervous during market cycles, just to be cautious, right. To have reserves in your bank. Right. And, and um, to have, you know, because at the blink of an eye, a lot of companies go under and you don't have a job anymore for these W2 employees. So, you know, multiple streams of income and, 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 and working hard is I think the way to get out of this situation. Yeah. I think those are, those are all great points. It's just something I've just, you know, anecdotally seen, you know, a lot of our, I haven't really seen too many, um, you know, commercial uh, property investments come through the pipeline and that was kind of tapering off. I mean, they're more expensive and, and we just didn't see a ton of them, but I, I don't think I've seen any, really this year that have come through the pipeline. It's been, you know, multifamily, you know, obviously you said people need a place to live. We've seen plenty of clients using their IRAs into uh, apartment buildings and things like that. And uh, it'd be interesting to see how many of these larger uh, like office farm type places are going to be converted or if they will be converted into multifamily housing. Mm -hmm. um, you got plenty of, re you got plenty of space for it. So you know, it seems like maybe, maybe something that could transition in the future. You're right, Alex. You know, and again, to be truthful, we bought two deals last year, uh, 52 million and 35 million. And we just got one in the works now, 35 million, because of the COVID, it has really given us a little lull how to do the due diligence, how to get out there, how to be able to really, and not only that, because of the toxic, I call it toxic, rent rolls, you know, with the delinquencies and this, with the moratorium on the evictions, all that, that has kind of slowed down, you know, purchases and things like that. You're right. And, you know, again, assisted living, Bo brought it up. I mean, in the last four months, we have flourished like crazy in the assisted living space for the seniors in the luxury space because we do ground up building. And uh, that's a non-working class because they're tired. So that's my partners really taken off and we are doing ground up constructions of assisted living and so on. So we are very, very bullish on that one. And also because of the demographical shift that's happening in USA and around the world, you know, 10,000, we say that so many times, 10,000 of the baby boomers are turning 65 every night in USA, 10,000 of them. So we have 54.6 uh, million actually out of the 365 million right now are in the baby boomer state which are turning 65 and then it will be 100 million oh my gosh in the next 30 years so the demographical shift if we stay at 400 million I'm just thinking out loud you know I don't know if we'll get there we were like in many many years back I came from India 40 years back we were 320 million now we are 365 in 40 years so you know population of america doesn't go you know that drastically like india 1.4 billion <laughs> you know but the thing is <laughs> the key thing i find is that in 30 years let's say 30 years 40 years if we are at 400 million and 100 million of us are 65 plus and in 85 will be 20 million 85 plus so older generation is going to be populating, you know, USA. So there is a huge demand and huge need for senior living, right? In different spaces like that. No, it's been such a pleasure to have you, Alex. It's been tremendous. I hope our audience, uh, even though they've been pretty quiet, I know it's a lot of time we get a lot of our audience to say where they're from and they ask some questions and so on. But you have dropped so many great nuggets for us and, uh, we thank you. And how can people reach you? You know, sure. Yeah, no. Um, if anyone wants to get a hold of me, you can give me a call at 727-754-9954. Or my email is a p e r n y at advantaira.com. Or just go to advantaira.com. And uh, you know, there's a lot of great information on there. We'll, uh, we'll get you to the right person and, and get your uh, get your questions answered. 
but uh, Bo and Vinny, thank you very much for having me on today. Um, you know, if we're running up on time, the ALF stuff is, is really cool. We've seen a lot of clients come in and do uh, assisted living, and you're, you're absolutely correct that, um, you know, it's, it's just a matter of time until we need a, a boom amount of bed space and, and housing for, um, you know, senior care. So uh, that, that'll be another interesting one. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Alex. And Bo, I wanted to give you good news, buddy. We got refinanced our Hilton Garden Inn during COVID. During <laughs> COVID, we just got the acceptance on it yesterday. And, uh, you know, I want to thank you. I know you were also helping us there with uh, Anshu and Ash, my buddies. And we are 100% occupied during COVID in the hotel. So this is very good, you know, and the good part was it's something to do with the, of course, uh, medical staff and all. They chose our hotel out of any place to be bringing their whole staff oh, wow. and everything for the next three months or something I heard. So we are very, very excited about it. And then we are going to be buying more in the uh, hospitality uh, range because we believe in it, even though we have had some really downturn in that market with the no travels happening and so forth like that. But, you know, but assisted living, thank you, Alex. Yeah, I'm so fired up about that. Actually, I'm starting another company in assisted living, even managing assisted living after they are built by us, A plus class. And then now we'll be purchasing them, my partner and I, and running them rather than selling them to the REITs because they've been buying it from us and they try to even give us a contract on the property, even if it's 50% built, can you believe it? Because they want to lock it in, the kind of quality we are putting. Anyway, but, uh, you know, thank you again for your time. Bo, any last comments, buddy? Yeah. Oh, no, nope. It was uh, great. I love I love uh, learning about IRAs and, and really appreciate your time. And, I, you know, I just goes to show you guys out there that are, wanting to, you know, purchase property or invest that there's options for you. Thank you, Alex. And you have a blessed day. We'll see you next week. Oh, next time. <laughs> Not <laughs> next week. <laughs> All right, Sean. Thanks again for very much for having me on. And for everyone out there, if you have any questions, let me know. I am always happy to help. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And God bless everybody. Thanks for listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. For show notes and useful resources, please visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com. For questions or comments, email info at InvestorFinancingPodcast.com. If you enjoy our show, please share it with your network. Until next time.